Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Well, Mark chapter 6 reports on two meals during Jesus' ministry, one right after the other. Last Sunday, we heard about the first one. It was King Herod Antipas' birthday party, of all things. This week, we read about the second meal in verses 30 through 44 of Mark chapter 6. If you'd like to turn there, this is page 841 in the Blue Bibles. Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 44. And this second meal, this meal with Jesus, well, it's held in a desert place somewhere somewhere around the edge of the Sea of Galilee, probably probably on the eastern side. But these two meals that Mark puts so close together, well, they couldn't be more different than each other, starting with who's there, starting with the guest list, so to speak. You see, at King Herod's birthday, well, there were all the powerful people. Mark chapter 6, verse 21 gives us a list It says there were were nobles and and military commanders and all the leading men of Galilee present. At the meal that Jesus hosted, well, there were Galileans, but, but not nobles. Instead, a great crowd of very common people. We'd probably call them rural peasants. 5,000 men and and probably 10,000 people in total. And this great group, they saw Jesus and his disciples in a boat, actually trying to get away from them, if you look at what's happening. And they ran. They ran around the edge of the lake to to where Jesus was going. They were so enthusiastic that they got there ahead of Jesus himself. Clearly, clearly, Jesus' crowd wants to be near him. I mean, they ran around a large lake to get to him. But there's something about them, Mark says, that's pitiful as well. In verse 34, he describes them. He says, they were like sheep without a shepherd. So in Mark chapter 6, we've got these two meals. It's all Galileans eating out, so to speak. But they're from opposite ends of the social spectrum. The powerful and important? Well, they've got an invitation to Herod's party. And the poor peasants, they're chasing Jesus around a lake. Now, we don't know what was on the menu at Herod's party, but but we can guess. In fact, we have a Roman cookbook from exactly this time period, this time period when Herod and his guests would have been chowing down. In this cookbook, it includes dishes that, that sound actually pretty good, like, for instance, pear souffle made with eggs and peeled pears and and pepper and cumin and honey and sweet cooking wine. I mean, I'd eat that. Almost sounds modern, but not quite. There's also a bit of fish sauce called garum in this pear souffle recipe. Believe it or not, this is made from the intestines of rotted mackerel and anchovies. Great, right? Or there's a recipe in this cookbook for veal, cooked with vinegar and raisins and honey and oil. Again, sounds pretty good. But then there's that garum in this too. Honestly, the Greeks and Romans loved this stuff. It was was like their ketchup and Worcester sauce rolled into one. They mass produced it. They still find amphorae marked with garum producers all over the Mediterranean world be like finding Heinz ketchup bottles under every rock. <laughs> but back to our dinner. We'll add one more recipe, something just to, to put with our pear souffle and our, and, our, um, and our beef. Dinner rolls made with young wine and anise seeds and cumin and sheep milk cheese and bay leaves. And yay, no garum in this one. So you can see how this would have been a fancy meal with with food that, despite that fish sauce, we would probably enjoy. 
On the other hand, we do know the menu at Jesus' dinner. We don't have to go find a cookbook for that. And there were no pear souffles or veal cooked with raisins. Just five little, no doubt hard, loaves of bread and two small fish. I mean, this is not even enough food for, for the 12 disciples and Jesus. Whoever planned their getaway across the lake maybe wanted to stop at a shop before they went, went on their way. So we have these, these two dinner parties in Mark 6, and there's two very different guest lists and two very, very different menus. And we also know, we also know these, these two dinner parties, well, they had very different outcomes as well, don't we? I mean, Herod's birthday, to put it far too kindly, got rowdy and ended with the murder of John the Baptist. Remember that from last Sunday? And the scene, as Mark describes it at Herod's party, is, is honestly one part disturbing and the other part kind of absurd. Mark reports that, that at some point in the evening, no doubt late, the daughter of Herod's wife Herodias, by her previous marriage, comes out and dances for what is very likely an entirely male audience. That sounds sketchy? Good, it is sketchy. And while this sort of thing would have been incredibly scandalous to, to any God-fearing Jew or even conventionally moral Romans or Greeks for that matter, it's actually quite believable for Herod and other elites of this time. We know from multiple sources that they did these sorts of things at dinner parties and, and honestly far worse than this. The idea that morals are, well, for the little people, that's an old one. But be that as it may, Herod and his birthday guests, they love the entertainment. And they're so pleased by his stepdaughter's performance that Herod offers her a reward. He says in verse 23 of Mark 6, Ask me for whatever you wish up to half the kingdom. Now this is a conventional hyperbole, of course. Nobody was dumb enough to actually ask a king for half his kingdom when he offered you a reward using this language. But it also was an opportunity for, for Herod's stepdaughter to get something for her, no doubt, degrading performance. And with her mother's advice, Herodias' daughter, well, she makes the most of this. She knows what she wants, or, or more accurately, what her mother wants, right? And she demands it. The head of John the Baptist on a platter. Now, Mark is clear that this gift request well, isn't what Herod expected. It actually seems that, that Herod liked John the Baptist, but he feels trapped, and he orders John's execution rather than embarrass himself at his own birthday party. I mean, seriously, what a terrible get-together, even if the food was good. So that's our first dinner party. What about the second dinner party? What, what happens at Jesus' meal that we heard about in our gospel reading this morning? Well, to start with, nobody dances inappropriately or gets murdered at Jesus' meal. That's an improvement. Instead, instead of a murder that extinguishes the life of the last and greatest of the prophets, Jesus' meal, well, it brings life to something old, and it points to and begins something new. Here's what I mean. You see, Jesus' meal, it actually looks back to the Exodus moment when God led his people out of slavery in Egypt. And at the same time, it looks forward. It looks the other direction to the Eucharist, to communion, as we celebrate it every Sunday. And we see this first. We see this first in the location of Jesus' meal. Mark makes a point to tell us it's in a desolate place, right? Actually, the word he uses is a desert, just like the wilderness. Same word, where Israel wandered for 40 years. And the second contact point between this moment of feeding 5,000 and Mark 6 and the Exodus is actually in verse 34. And that line describing, describing that great crowd as, as sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd. 
Friends, this is not just Mark coming up with a somewhat poetic turn of phrase to describe the pitiful state of this crowd who had chased Jesus across a lake. It's a reference. A reference back to Numbers chapter 27 where where Moses hands over the leadership of, of Israel to his successor, Joshua. And actually, Moses, we know, prays in that moment. He says in verse 17, Who shall go out before them, before Israel, and come in before them? Who shall lead them out and bring them in? That the congregation of the Lord may not be as sheep without a shepherd. No, Mark didn't make that up. He's pointing us to a moment in Scripture. And next, did you notice how how Jesus organizes the people in Mark chapter 6? This is verse 39 and 40. It's got this funny little description. It says he organizes them by hundreds and fifties. I wonder who counted. But that's what it says. And this, this little detail points, points to how Moses organized the camp of Israel as they were in the Exodus. We see it in Exodus chapter 18, verse 21, where it says that that the camp was laid out in thousands and hundreds and fifties. So individually, I know these may look like small details. A desert, a turn of phrase about sheep, there are quite a few of those in the Bible, and a peculiar seating plan. But together they really are pointing us at something. They're telling us that this meal with Jesus, what's more than just a snack on the seashore, it is in fact an exodus moment, a a new dispensation of the old story of God's people with Jesus as the shepherd that Moses prayed for all the way back there in Numbers chapter 27. These people are part of something big. And friends, this is before we even get to the food itself, those those five loaves and two small fish that were miraculously enough for for 5,000 men plus no doubt doubt many others. So how does the food fit in? What do we make of the meal? I mean, it's really simple, right? Two little loaves or five little loaves of bread and, and small fish. Exactly the kind of food that Galilean peasants would have been used to. They would have had every day. At the same time, at the same time, there's a, there's a faint final exodus echo here as well. You see, God miraculously provided food in the desert. Remember that? Manna, bread, and quail, meat. Or a carb and a protein. I'd like to point out to my wife that there were no vegetables in this meal that God planned, but... <laughs> But here, here on the shores of Galilee, 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 he riffs, so to speak, on the same menu plan, a carb and a protein. But there's a look ahead, a look ahead in Jesus' meal as well, a look ahead to the meal we share together every Sunday, communion, the Eucharist. And friends, this is in the miracle itself. You can see this in verse 41 of Mark chapter 6. Mark describes what happens in this way, saying Jesus, taking the five loaves and two fish, looked up to heaven, said a blessing, broke the loaves, and gave them to the disciples and to set before the people. It's hard to imagine a scene that, that looks more like what we do every Sunday here at Epiphany when we celebrate communion than this. There's a blessing, a prayer. This is how you prayed in the world that Jesus was in. A breaking of the bread and a distributing, a giving to the gathered congregation, the gathered flock after all. Bless, break, give. And as verse 42 says, they all ate and were satisfied. Friends, sometimes when the miraculous meals with Jesus come up in our readings, well, it's easy to focus entirely on the miracle itself and and ask how did, or sometimes, 
did Jesus really do that? Or could he just break up that bread in little tiny pieces? I mean, did he really feed 5,000 men here in Mark or 4,000 in Matthew 16? Now, for the record, I have no problem in believing these miracles, and I hope you don't either. I mean, I believe Jesus died for the sins of the whole world and then rose from the dead. Once you're over that bridge, what's so hard about believing in a miraculous meal or two? But I am convinced. I am convinced that, that we're missing, missing the main dish of the meal, so to speak, if we focus on the mechanics alone of feeding so many from so little. Jesus, yes, feeds 5,000 men because they're hungry, but he does it in the way he does it to show beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is God's Messiah, that he is the one that Moses prayed for, for God's people all the way back in Numbers. And he also does it to show that his followers, well, they are the new Israel gathered, gathered like Israel gathered around Moses. They're God's people. And he does it. He does it to invite us today to be part of that Israel and also to be part of that meal, to be part of the Eucharist where we bless and break and give Jesus himself. And Mark, Mark for his part here in Mark chapter 6 puts the story of Jesus' meal next to Herod's out-of-control party. I think to force us to consider the choices we are making and which kingdom we are part of. To put it another way, Mark, Mark is placing these two meals back to back and asking us, well, which dinner do you plan on attending? I mean, Herod's birthday party, it does look good, whether whether pear souffle and veal with raisins was actually on the menu. All the best people were definitely there. And they were glad to be there. But it ends. It ends in a shambles and as an offense to God. Now today, we don't have Herod Antipas down the street inviting us to his place to celebrate. But friends, hear me on this. It is worth thinking about the groups we wish to be a part of, to be identified with, particularly those that, that are socially prestigious, and ask ourselves, what are they really celebrating, and, and whether or not we might find ourselves co-opted into something evil in the end. I can guarantee you the folks that showed up at Herod's party did not expect to be co-opted into a murder as the main event. On the other hand, it's hard to imagine something more humble than a bit of bread and fish with Jesus on a desert hillside. Well, for that matter, a little wafer and wine here in our converted server farm of a building in western Fairfax County. But friends, packed, packed into our Sunday Eucharistic meal is God's power and his redeeming love, the same things he shows us when he fed the 5,000. It is the exodus from slavery to sin and death. It is membership in the new Israel. It is participation in the body of Christ, the congregation, the flock of Christ. There are two meals. There are two hosts inviting us in Mark chapter 6. Choose wisely. Hint, attend the one without the fish sauce. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>